All right, well, good morning. Please join me, if you would, in Philippians chapter 4. And as we turn in our Bibles, Lord, Father, we are thankful for the word. Inspired, inerrant, infallible, preserved for us. And we ask that you would give us a gift of teaching, that we would understand this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so in the first part of chapter 4 last week, we looked at the uh, peace of God, which is invaluable. And as I was continuing to think about that, uh, we read in Psalm 37 that mark the perfect man and behold the upright. For the end of that man is peace. So who is that man? Who is perfect and upright? Jesus, Prince of Peace. For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And we are also that man, if you will, in that we are in Christ. And in Christ we have peace with God, we have the peace of God. And that's what the first part of the chapter was last week, as we get along with each other, as we lay down our lives for each other. Rejoice in the Lord always. Live Christ-like lives. Pray instead of worrying, thinking on Jesus, and doing the things that the Holy Spirit has taught us to do. And been, obviously been thinking about that. Last Monday, I was running errands with Eloise. And she had the hiccups. Now, I don't like the hiccups. I don't know anybody who likes the hiccups. But I was trying to think, uh, which one of these old wives' tales can I explain to her how to get rid of hiccups. I think none. So I just prayed, Lord, please do for her what she cannot do for herself. And within 10 seconds, the hiccups were gone. Something simple, something in, relatively speaking, insignificant. If the Almighty God who is sustaining the universe, who holds in his hand the breath of 8 billion people on earth, will hear and act on that, don't you think he's going to hear and act on your cry? Yeah, amen. And so we read in Psalm 5, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For unto thee will I pray. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. And in that is a lesson an exhortation. Very, very important part of the day is the morning. Uh, Jesus, the Father gave us his best. We should give him our best. And that means every morning, if you want a peace-filled day, uh, you have to spend time alone with the Lord, in prayer, in the Word, tapping into the peace of God. And that quality time which does set the tone for the rest of the day, is under attack. Busy, 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 busy. We have to be very diligent to protect that time. So, moving forward then into Philippians chapter 4, we move to a, a subject of contentment, which is very elusive in a discontent world. We read in verse 10, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye all were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Paul is transitioning from the peace of God to contentment, but when we think about it, the peace of God and contentment really go hand in hand. And he is uh, exhorting this church that he, he is rejoicing in the Lord greatly. Just as in verse 4 he had exhorted them to, he does that himself. And he is rejoicing in the Lord greatly because this church, in the most recent occurrence, has cared for him, given him their thoughtfulness, given him their consideration, given him provision for his needs. And this is not the first time. It says that it flourished again. Uh, and they, they cared for him spiritually. He's in prison. They sent to him one of their own, Epaphroditus, to encourage him. And with Epaphroditus, they sent to him material needs, you know, like food, 
water, clothing, because Rome gave absolutely nothing to its prisoners. If family and friends didn't bring these things for a prisoner, they, they would die a horrible death. Uh, and we read in chapter 2 of this book that both the spiritual need and material need came in the person of this Epaphroditus, chapter 2, verse 25, where he says, Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. This most recent care package from the church at Philippi came by this man. And back to chapter 4, verse 10, uh, Paul says it flourished, it revived. Their care for him revived. It blossomed again. This is not the first time they have cared for him. This is yet another time in a string of events. Uh, and it seems, as it reads here, they would do so at every opportunity they got. Now, they didn't always have an opportunity. You know, perhaps their financial situation was such that they couldn't. Uh, perhaps they didn't know how or where to provide him a care package, whatever. But whenever they had the opportunity to care for this man, they did so. Verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Uh, He's mentioning their care for him in verse 10. He's very quick <laughs> to point out. He's not mentioning that with an ulterior motive. This is, verse 10 is not a subtle hint from him to them to get more, to give him more. This is not a part of a fundraising project. He's not begging. He's not telling people to dig deep and provide for his need. No, he's saying that he has been instructed and he has learned by experience to be content no matter what the situation is in his life. He knows by experience how to have nothing. He knows how by experience to have excess. He has been instructed by, if, if Paul's been instructed, who's, in, who's instructing the Apostle Paul? Holy Spirit. We have the same teacher. The Holy Spirit has taught him how to be full, has taught him how to be hungry, has taught him how to have access, and has taught him how to suffer need, having too little. And so walking in the Spirit, following Jesus, Paul has learned contentment. He has learned to be content with whatever God provides because he is the provider. Paul knows that his life is in God's hands. And he is content to be in God's hands and to leave the provision for his needs right there with God. Any different for us? None. Our lives are in God's hands. And when we embrace that, when we recognize and acknowledge that we are in God's hands, then we can learn to be content with whatever he provides. And if he only provides a little, we can still be content because our lives are hid with Christ in God. And our Father knows what we need and he'll take care of us one way or another. We can have the peace of God and not worry about stuff like that. And along the way, as we walk with him, whether we have too much or too little, he teaches us very valuable lessons about his faithfulness. I was at a pastor conference once, and uh, a young pastor, it was not a young pastor, it was an old pastor, but he told of when he was planting his first church as a young pastor. He had young kids, a young family, and the only food in their house were a couple of hot dogs. And he despaired. 
And he was having a conversation with God. It wasn't, praise you, Lord. <laughs> he was having a conversation with God. And he ran out the front door and tripped over a bunch of grocery bags that had been placed there by someone in the church. <laughs> Learned a valuable lesson that day. I think we all have testimonies. Amen? We all have testimonies about God's faithfulness to us. I know for a fact Monica and I have a slew of them. I believe you all do. Uh, we're in his hands. He is faithful. No matter how much or how little, we can be content. But that's not natural. Contentment is not natural. It must be learned. Contentment is a condition of the heart. It's part of being civilized to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. Just like our children and grandchildren have to be civilized to be a part of our society. Amen? <laughs> and the opposite of contentment doesn't have to be learned. It is natural. It's covetousness, right? But with contentment, walking hand in hand with contentment that is learned is peace. No stress, no worry. Hand in hand with contentment is, is joy. Uh, something that transcends the physical circumstances. And hand in hand with contentment is liberty from the snares and the bondage of the things of this world. Discontentment is a thief. Discontentment is natural. It's part of our flesh. It's part of our carnal nature. And it's a self-inflicted misery. Because how much is enough for our flesh? There is no such thing. The end is always misery. Whining and complaining about never having enough, never having good enough, uh, never being pleased. And in that is spiritual strife with our provider. Discontentment says to our Father in heaven, uh, I know what's best for me, you don't. Uh, and discontentment is really, I want something that I cannot take home. What is home? What is our home? Our citizenship is in heaven. All the things of this world stay in this world. That's our home. I want something I can't take home. And it's murmuring and complaining. We've been through that in numbers. We're going to go through it again. Now, we live in a society that stimulates discontentment. This materialism, this consumerism, uh, it's fueled by more and better and different and new and improved. No, oh, we want all of those things. But the Lord teaches contentment, which is fueled by enough. What I have is enough. We are instructed, as Paul says, I am instructed, we are instructed to be content. Proverbs says, better is a little with the fear of the Lord. What is the fear of the Lord? Psalm 19, the word of God. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. What comes with a bunch of stuff? bunch of trouble, usually. Uh, Proverbs says, better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. And how much better is it to get wisdom than gold, and to get understanding rather than to be chosen than silver? And the one recording the Proverbs is Solomon, when he was young. And he had a prayer in, Solo, excuse me, in, in Proverbs chapter 30, starting in verse 7. Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity 
and lies, number one. And number two, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take in the name of my God in vain. I want enough. Uh, that was the message of John the Baptist to the soldiers, you know, when he started his ministry and people flocking to him because for the first time in 400 years, there's a prophet and people were coming to him. And in Luke 3, the soldiers likewise demanded of him saying, and what shall we do? And he said unto them, do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. No whining, no complaining, no moaning, no groaning. At one point in my career as a marketing manager for IBM, I had a, a team of salesmen, and there was one guy in particular who was frequently coming into my office complaining that he didn't have enough money, that he needed a raise. Finally, I said, there is a solution. Go sell something. <laughs> He didn't like me. Oh, well. <laughs> you probably see his face. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Timothy writes about unbelievers in chapter 6. Uh, we speaks of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain, material gain, stuff, supposing that gain is godliness. From such, withdraw thyself. But... Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we will carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. We are instructed by the Holy Spirit to be content. Something that we are not naturally. And also... Uh, in Hebrews chapter 13, the first part of a, a verse that we quote very frequently, uh, we quote the second part, but we can't forget the first part. Let your conversation, your lifestyle, chapter 13, verse 5, let your lifestyle, your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We say that a lot. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. We're in his hands. He knows what we need. He provides for us. Be content, not covetousness. Now, when Solomon was an old guy, uh, he con conducted an experiment in discontentment. Recorded for us in the book of Ecclesiastes. And it ends with a testimony of learned contentment. In chapter 5, verse 12, he's inspired to record the sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. But the end of the book, chapter 12, verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Be content. Seek God. And so instructed by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, we are to learn contentment by experience. We have to experience having too little and choosing to be content. We have to experience having too much and choosing to be content. Because when you have too much, do you always have too much? No. What does money do usually? You know, we ride like this. We have to be content no matter where we are on that wave. We need a calm and trusting heart in whatsoever state we're in. Because the earth and the fullness thereof are God's. 
in whose hands we are. And so that is contentment. It's contrary to our natural state, our nature, but it is right in line with God's. And contentment is not possible by the flesh. It is possible by the Spirit. Therefore, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. I can do. In verse 9, uh, Paul had said to them, uh, these things which I have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, do. Contentment being one of those things that they have learned and received, heard and seen in him, and he is doing. I can do Oh, and he's also doing it without murmuring and disputing because you can't murmur and dispute and be content. Those are expressions of discontentment. I can do all things. There are no exceptions. Whatsoever, whatever state, I can do all things through Christ, in Christ, by Christ, which strengtheneth me. I don't have it, the strength to be content. Jesus has the strength for me to be content. And he taught us in John 15, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. He tells us how to live. He shows the heart of the Father. He teaches us his mind. He says, follow me. Trust me. Do as I say. Do as I do. And we can't without him. Paul had a medical need at one point in his ministry, which we covered in 2 Corinthians. He had this thing called a thorn in the flesh, and it was really bothersome to him. And he prayed that the Lord would remove that from him. He was not content with this medical condition. What did the Lord say to him? Uh, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, he said to the church at Corinth, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Psalm 39 says, Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. That's one of the things we learn as we walk with him. We're incredibly frail. We're not strong. We don't have it locked and loaded. We're in need of mercy all the time. And I saw a, a quote from Martin Lloyd Jones, Martin Lloyd Jones earlier this week, uh, a pastor from maybe a hundred years ago. He said, thank God my salvation does not depend upon my frail hold on him, but on his mighty grasp of me. Amen? The very same thing can be said of our daily bread that comes from the hand of God, our provider. And it's a trial. But it's, everybody's got the same trial. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, there is no temptation, no trial. Taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. What's the way of escape? Jesus, the way, the life, and the truth. Verse 14. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. 
For even in Thessalonica, he sent once and again unto my necessity. So Paul's reciting some history with this church. He went to Philippi. He planted this church. And he's telling them uh, right now, you've done a really good thing in sharing in my trial, sharing in my needs. And they've done it repeatedly so. Because when he left Philippi, he continued on to Thessalonica, and then to Berea, and then to Athens, and then to Corinth, preaching the gospel, and all that's recorded in Acts chapter 17. And this church was the only church that shared materially in the ministry, providing his daily needs, and they did it multiple times. So this church is a generous church. It has a history of an open hand. The Lord tells us in the law, in Deuteronomy chapter 15, If there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren within any of thy gates, in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother, but thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need, in that which he wanteth. Beware that there be not a thought in thine wicked heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release, is at hand, and thine hand be evil or greedy. The evil eye is greedy. Against thy poor brother, and thou givest nothing, not. And he cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin unto thee. Thou shalt surely give him, and thine heart shall not be greed when thou givest unto him. Cheerful giver, right? Because that for this thing, the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works, in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in the land. The church at Philippi had an open hand. They had the Father's heart. As recorded in Psalm 81, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. This church at Philippi had been gifted. They had a spiritual gift called giving. Romans chapter 12, verse 8 says, He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. In the, in the flow of the conversation of spiritual gifts, in Romans chapter 12, giving... Open hand, seeing a need, meeting a need, that's a spiritual gift. The church at Philippi had an open hand, a history of repeatedly supplying the material need for the Apostle Paul. They had the heart of the Father, they had a gift of the Spirit, and he exercised it. You know what? So does this church. This church has a history of having an open hand. This church has the heart of the Father, and this church has a gift for giving. It's a blessing. Verse 17. He repeats himself. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. I'm not bringing this up <laughs> with an ulterior motive. I'm not telling you this in order to get more from you. He's not asking for another gift from this generous and fruitful church. Instead, his motive is that they would bear even more fruit and deposit and have another deposit, if you will, into their account in heaven. It's what are the branches abiding in the vine? Those that bear fruit, what happens to them? They're purged. They're pruned. Why? They bear more fruit. That's Paul's motive. That's his desire for this church in saying these things. Uh, in the letter to Timothy, first one, chapter 6, uh, he instructs his son in the faith to charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. They that do good that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, to share. If they, in their state, abound, they 
share with those who are in lack, willing to communicate, willing to share, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may hold on to eternal life. Being a good steward, understanding that the stuff we have is not our stuff. It's the Lord's. Everything is his. We are his. We have been purchased with his blood. We are not our own. Whatever it is that he has given to us to be a steward of is to bless others. And in so doing, that's laying up treasure in heaven, as Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and dust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. He wants spiritual fruit in heaven in the Church of Philippi's account. Verse 18. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. As mentioned prior, this church had sent Epaphroditus to encourage Paul spiritually and also to provide for his material needs. And he returned him to them. Uh, but here we're, we learn that Paul received that gift in the spirit in which, which it was offered. It was a love offering. It was a sweet-smelling sacrifice of the saints in Philippi. And it was approved by and pleasing to God. And now he has enough. He abounds. Verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Paul knows that his life is in God's hands. He also knows what goes around comes around the law of sowing and reaping. He so wrote to the churches in Galatia, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. Well-doing is obeying. And we can't obey without the spirit of Christ. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. And he spoke of giving in his second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 9. He said, but I say this, he that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver, because God is a cheerful giver. <laughs> Have my heart. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Sowing and reaping, what goes around comes around. In Proverbs, he that giveth unto the poor shall not lack. But he that hideth his eyes shall have many a curse. Oh, I don't see the need. Oh, I can't meet the need if I can't see it. I'm going to cover my eyes. Proverbs also says, whoso stops his ears at the cry of the poor, he shall also cry himself, but shall not be heard. And finally, in Proverbs, the liberal soul, the generous soul, shall be made fat. But he that watereth shall be watered also himself. And he that watereth shall also be watered himself. Goes around, comes around. And suffering lack goes around. And having more than you need goes around. Find your place in that and respond accordingly, learning to be content. 
Now Paul's going to sign off on this letter, starting in verse 20. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you, chiefly or primarily, particularly, they that are of Caesar's household. <laughs> so there's greeting here. To conclude the letter, there's greetings all around in the family of God. It's a wonderful thing. Where's the family of God? Everywhere. The family of God is everywhere. Even in Caesar's household. Even in the Biden administration. Even in the Trump campaign. Even in Trudeau's government up in Canada, even in Macron's government over in France, even in the governments of Brazil and Norway and the United Kingdom and Israel and Iran and Egypt and China and Russia, God has his people everywhere because the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. He is the king of all the earth. That's why Jesus came. Pilate quizzing him. John 18, art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And that's the family of God, and they are everywhere. God has put them everywhere. Verse 23, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The last word, grace. How sweet this sound. Let us grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This message on this portion of chapter 4 on contentment is material contentment. Yes? We're to learn to be content. Okay, what about spiritual contentment? Let's flip the coin. Are we to be spiritually content? No, never. That is called complacency. It leads to lukewarmness. We're to always covet the very best gift. Just so. Every day, we decrease, Jesus increases. Every day, you know, I want less of the world. I want more of Jesus. Jesus is enough for me. That's what we're to learn. We are instructed to be content, that godliness with contentment is great gain. To be content with such things as you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We have been instructed. Now we have to learn by experience to be content knowing that our lives are in God's hand knowing what God has said and he has said that there is no lack for those that fear the Lord and those that seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing and that none that trust in him will be desolate you believe it do it Bank on it. God will show you his faithfulness again and again. Amen? Amen. If you'd stand with me, please.